Chapter Twenty Eight of Stories of Old Greece and Rome by Emily Kip Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Eight, The Story of Jason, Part Two. Once in the course of the voyage, Jason was attacked by a flock of brazen feathered birds that showered their sharp metal plumage down on the Argonauts and wounded some of them sorely. Jason soon found that weapons were of no avail against these formidable enemies, so he consulted the figurehead that had always counselled him wisely. In obedience to its advice the heroes clashed their swords and spears furiously against their shields, until the birds, terrified by the noise, flew away and never returned. When Argo approached the simple glades, or clashing islands, Jason remembered the words of Phineas, who had advised him to let free a dove whose speed was less than that of his swift vessel before he attempted a passage. If it flew easily between the rocks, then the ship could safely follow it, with no chance of being ground to pieces as the islands clashed together. When the Argonauts reached this dangerous spot, Jason sent a dove out before him. He watched its flight anxiously, and when it glided between the rocks, with only a tail-feather caught, he guided the ship so close behind it that, as he slid through the opening made by the rebound of the islands, the deadly rocks merely grazed his rudder. Since their destructive power depended on allowing no vessel to pass them unharmed, the evil force that the islands possessed was now broken, and they were henceforth chained fast to the bottom of the sea. At last the Argo reached the shores of Colchis, and Jason made known to King Aetes his desire to possess the Golden Fleece. The owner of that wonderful pelt was very naturally not ready to give it to even the boldest stranger, but he treated the Argonauts kindly, and even promised to bestow upon Jason, if he could catch and harness to a plough, two brazen-hooved, fire-breathing bulls. Then, having done this, he must plough up a certain piece of ground, sacred to Mars, and sow the field with dragon's teeth, just as Cadmus had done. Last of all he must conquer the armed giants, that would spring up in the field after the sowing, and then slay the dragon that guarded the golden fleece. This was certainly enough to daunt any hero, but Jason, relying on the help of Juno, agreed to the king's terms, and went down to the seashore, where his ship lay, to consult the figurehead, who had never yet failed him. On the way he met Medea, the king's daughter, who was much taken with the young stranger's beauty, and hoped to induce him to marry her. Medea herself was very beautiful, and being also a sorceress, she was an invaluable ally in the adventure that had brought Jason and his friends from a far distant land. So before many days had passed, Medea plighted her troth to the young hero who needed help sorely, and the king's daughter promised to give him the aid of her magic arts. On the day appointed for the great task, Jason boldly approached the fire-breathing bulls, for Medea had given him a charm by which the fierce brutes were rendered harmless, and were easily yoked and harnessed to the plough. Then, in the presence of the astonished spectators, who expected to see him crushed beneath the brazen hoofs, Jason ploughed the field, and, having sown it with dragon's teeth, stood ready, sword in hand, to meet the attack of the giants, who sprang up out of the ground clad in full armour. When he saw the glittering spears turned toward him, Jason's heart began to quail lest, after all, Medea's help should prove ineffective, and even the sorceress herself felt a momentary doubt of her own power to save her lover from his foes. As the armed men were about to rush upon him, Jason threw a stone in their midst, according to Medea's instructions, and the giants turned against each other and began a furious battle that ended in the destruction of the whole armed host. Then the hero, accompanied by Medea, hastened to the tree where the golden fleece hung, and here a charm was needed to lull to sleep the dragon that guarded the treasure. As soon as the great eyes, that had never been known to close, began to shut one by one, Jason stepped softly up behind the monster and cut off its head. It was but a moment's work to tear the fleece from the tree where it had hung for so many years, and to bear it in triumph to the Argo, where Jason's friends stood anxiously awaiting his coming. The men were already at the oars, for he had told them to be ready to sail at a moment's notice, when he should appear bearing the golden fleece. In spite of Aetes' promise, the hero did not trust him, and so made his preparations for departure very secretly. When he and Medea boarded the Argo with their prize, the rowers bent with all their strength to the oars, and the ship 
slid silently and swiftly out of the harbour. Aetes soon learned that the Grecian vessel had left his shores, carrying on board the Golden Fleece, his daughter, and, worst of all, his only son and heir, Absyrtus. So he hurriedly manned his royal barge with rowers, and set out after the Argonauts. Although the fugitive vessel made good speed, the king's ship began to gain on it, and as Jason watched the distance between the vessels growing less and less, he was filled with despair, and begged the sorceress to aid them with her magic. Medea did not care what fate befell the Argonauts, but she had no desire to leave Jason, and return to her father's court, so she did not hesitate to resort to any means of preventing the king from overtaking her. She therefore killed her brother, Absyrtus, and cutting his body into pieces, dropped them one by one over the side of the vessel. Aetes, seeing the remains of his only son floating on the water, stopped to collect them, so that the body might have suitable burial, and by this delay the Argonauts were allowed to escape. The wretched king then returned to Colchis, where he buried Absyrtus with prayers to the gods to bring vengeance upon his inhuman daughter. When the Argo with its triumphant crew reached Thessaly, they found that their arrival caused great surprise as well as joy, for King Peleus had never supposed they would return, and felt himself secure against any further trouble from the youth with only one sandal. He was therefore much dismayed at seeing Jason return, especially as he came unharmed, and bearing so rich a trophy as the Golden Fleece. The usurper knew that his days of power were over, and when Jason again demanded the kingdom in his father's name, Peleus was forced to resign his throne to the lawful king. Old Ison was then summoned from his place of banishment, and restored to his rightful place. But he was so weak and decrepit that power had no charm for him, and he accepted his throne very reluctantly. So Jason begged his wife to use her magic in behalf of the old king, and Medea, anxious to please her lover, willingly promised to restore Ison to all the vigour of manhood. To prepare the magic potion that was to bring youth and health, the sorceress went out into the meadows on nine successive nights, beginning with the new moon, and gathered herbs whose magic properties she alone could tell. Then she set a cauldron in the deepest part of the woods, and built under it a slow fire that burned always night and day. In the cauldron she threw the magic herbs, flowers with acrid juice, stones from the far east, and sand from the all-surrounding ocean, hoar-frost gathered by moonlight, a screech-owl's head and wings, and the entrails of a wolf. Then she added some bits of tortoise-shell, and the liver of a stag, for these animals are tenacious of life, and the head and beak of a crow that outlives nine generations of men. All these she boiled together, stirring them with an olive branch, and when she lifted out the branch it was full of new leaves and heavy with young olives. These preparations being finished, and the time being a full moon, Medea went forth alone into the forest with old Ison, just at midnight when all creatures slept, and no breath of wind stirred the trees. She laid the old man on a bed of herbs, and after putting him into a deep sleep, cut his throat, and let out the sluggish blood of age. Then she poured into the wound the juices from her cauldron, and when these began to flow through the king's weak frame, he underwent a wonderful change, for his hair and beard lost their whiteness, and took on the glossy hue of youth. His paleness changed to the ruddiness of manhood, and his feeble limbs felt all the vigour of a hero in his prime. When the daughters of Peleus saw this miracle of old Ison transformed into a stalwart man, they begged Medea to use her magic in restoring their father to his former youthfulness, and the sorceress promised to help Peleus, just as she had the father of Jason. So she prepared a cauldron full of boiling water, and pretended to put into it the necessary ingredients for the magic potion. But when the devoted, though too credulous daughters of Peleus, killed their father, and put his body into the cauldron, as Medea had directed, they did not restore him to youth, but merely ended very effectively the life that they so ardently wished to prolong. Though Medea's great beauty and her power as a sorceress kept Jason faithful to her for many years, he at last grew weary of her and prepared to wed a maiden named Croesa. Pretending to approve of his choice and concealing her rage at Jason's heartlessness, Medea sent the bride a beautiful, though poisoned, robe. The unsuspicious Croesa was delighted with this rich gift, but as soon as it rested on her shoulders, the hapless maiden was seized with terrible convulsions, from which she shortly died. 
Then Medea killed with her own hands the children that she had borne to Jason, so that she might have no reminder of his falseness, and fled in her dragon-car to Athens, where she sought the protection of King Aegeus, the father of Theseus. Here she lived many years, for the king, not knowing her history, and being enamoured of her beauty, married her and made her his queen. Jason, filled with remorse and despair, now led a most unhappy life, and spent most of his time on the seashore beside the great hulk of the Argo, which was slowly rotting away on the beach. One day a sudden gale detached a loose beam from the vessel, and it fell on Jason's head, killing him instantly. Thus ended for ever the voyages of the Argonauts. End of chapter 28